My name is Michael Johnston, and I am introducing this series of recordings to document the first all-day singing of Sacred Harp in Charlotte, North Carolina. It was held on Saturday, February 7, 2009, at the Archdale Church of Christ from 9 o'clock in the morning to 4 o'clock that afternoon. Since this had never happened in or near Charlotte, we asked Hugh McGraw, the nationally known expert and teacher of Sacred Harp Singing, to lead a singing school so those unfamiliar with the Faso La Sight singing system could learn it quickly and put it to use throughout the day's intense schedule. We used the 1991 edition, and you can get one for yourself at OriginalSacredHarp.com. If you have your own copy, get it ready and sing along with some of the songs included in these recordings. Sacred Harp and all shape note singing is much more about the participation than observation. Hugh would often say, I would drive hours to sing Sacred Harp, but I wouldn't cross the road to listen to it. I'd like to address my musician friends now. Those who have spent years practicing in the intricacies of style and nuance in their chosen instrument are often shocked and repelled by the full-throated, top-volume singing heard in Sacred Harp. There is subtlety, but it is not in the forefront and often becomes buried under the enthusiasm of the singers when they finally get a chance to sing their chosen kind of music. The texts sung are usually the original words, and writers include such respected names as Isaac Watts, Charles Wesley, and John Newton. You know these names from your hymnal, and you know many of the tunes as well. The hymnal versions are smoothed over in some spots with traditional four-part voice writing. Many sacred harp songs were originally written in three voices, though most today include an alto part. When you teach your choirs to sing, you rightfully prevent the kind of singing that is the backbone of sacred harp singing. Quiet and accurate sound is paramount and all choir members must listen to the others to make sure they blend well. Since a polished performance is not a goal of sacred harp singing, this is not a part of the style. Singers are encouraged to participate fully and enthusiastically with their whole voices, and after they are comfortable, most will stand up to lead their favorite tunes. This loud and unpolished sound is a large impediment to many fine musicians who, upon hearing it, recoil with shock at its volume, rough tone, and strong dialectical pronunciation. I suggest, if this is the case with you, that you listen through the outer sound to the counterpoint which forms the rough harmony to find something interesting to your mind. Listen to the open fifths when they occur as a normal part of the harmony. Hear the modal scales still in use and the refusal to raise the leading tone. Dorian and Mixolydian are still as much a part of sacred harp as major and minor. Enjoy the fuguing tunes where each part gets a chance at some brief imitative counterpoint, something never heard in other social singing. Think about these points and listen for them, and I hope that you too will find something satisfying and culturally significant that will bring you in to sing Sacred Harp the next time you have a chance. I'd like to read you a quote from one of the greatest American composers who also played the organ and directed church choirs, Charles Ives. At the outdoor camp meeting services in Reading, all the farmers, their families, field hands and friends for miles around would come afoot or in their farm wagons. I remember how the great waves of sound used to come through the trees when things like Beulah Land, Woodworth, Nearer My God to Thee, The Shining Shore, Nettleton, In the Sweet By and By, and the like, were sung by thousands of let-out souls. The music notes and words on paper are about as much like what they were at those moments as the monogram on a man's necktie may be like his face. 
Father, who led the singing, sometimes with his cornet or his voice, sometimes with both voice and arms, and sometimes in the quieter hymns with a violin or French horn, would always encourage the people to sing their own way. Most of them knew the words and music, their version, by heart and sang it that way. If they threw the poet or composer around a bit, so much the better for the poetry and the music. There was power and exaltation in those great conclaves of sound from humanity. Once when Father was asked, How can you stand it to hear old John Bell, who is the best stonemason in town, bellow off-key the way he does at camp meetings? His answer was, Old John is a supreme musician. Look into his face and hear the music of the ages. Don't pay too much attention to the sounds. If you do, you may miss the music. You won't get a heroic ride to heaven on pretty little sounds. And now I'd like to address some of the history of sacred harp and shape note singing, including reasons for its longevity and popularity. In the timeline of American history, Shape note singing goes back to the colonies. Singing masters, such as William Billings, 1746 to 1800, used it in the schools. It was printed in the primers. Sacred Harp, published in 1844, came later, and you'll find several Billings tunes included in it. There were others that shared the format, but used a different name, such as Southern Harmony, from 1835. The key to understanding the place of this music in the culture is to realize the lack of instruments in the early days of the settlement. And here I don't mean folk instruments that are played by ear. The shape note system allowed everyone who could read to sing by memorizing a shape. And yes, there are differences in the shape note systems. Anyway, it was expected that every child would be taught music. How times have changed. There was music in the school books that children used every day. They were not taught how to play instruments because instruments were expensive and scarce. They were taught to sing without instruments, and the shape notes accomplished this. At this time, nearly all of America was rural, but in the cities, the churches had pipe organs, harmoniums, pump organs, and even small orchestras in a few. People who can read music for keyboards, violins, flutes, and such do not need shapes, so guess where the tradition flourished? It's not because it was primitive, it's because trained musicians didn't need it, and trained musicians could read music in round notes by Mozart, Haydn, and others. Now, one can make the argument that the music itself was primitive by comparing the harmony in the books to that of the then-current European composers. It's not a fair comparison, and the end result is usually that shape note compositions were written by people who did not know better, lacked a sense of musicality, and could or would not advance. Why then does it sound that way? People always want to know. I answer with a question. If you took people who wanted to participate and express themselves by singing, but had never studied music formally, what kind of music would you give them? Complex harmonies with great subtlety, multiple accidentals, fascinating rhythms? Obviously not. Perfect octaves and perfect fifths are easiest to tune, and this music makes the absolute most of that. Early Americans were mostly British, and what musical scale or mode is common in folk songs from the British Isles? That would be Mixolydian and Dorian. And guess which modes most of the songs in Sacred Harp use? That's right. Although there are raised sevenths sometimes, that characteristic lowered seventh is common, just as it is in the folk songs that came across the ocean with the colonists. Likewise, there is the raised sixth of the Dorian. Just like anything you get used to, folks who sung these pieces of music liked them and their children heard it and they liked it. Of course, the metropolitan music scene evolved, as we all know, from reading the musical history of America. Somehow the story of the white spiritual is often left out. There is one criticism that can be fairly applied here. 
Like it or not, Sacred Harp as a musical style is frozen in time. Other music developed to the point where it is actually difficult to plot the development from music then to music now. After about 1915, it all goes crazy. But the practitioners of the oblong singing books did not see their music in the same way as the city folks did. They felt no need to change it and they liked it the way it was. There was no mechanism, such as schools or cultural pressure, to quote, improve it. So it stayed exactly where it began. It is then the perfect living record of a time that exceeds generational memory. It can teach us a great deal about the lives of those who lived and sung it. But like most folk traditions, it requires that you pull back the layers to examine the real facts and not be swayed by music history professors mainly interested in tracing the development of Western music in this country. You might be surprised that there are large numbers of new pieces written in this style. And yes, the new music being written today matches exactly to the authentic sacred harp sound. The shape note songs are different from Negro spirituals in that they were written down, where today's choirs will sing an arrangement of Swing Low Sweet Chariot and call it a spiritual, it sounds nothing like a spiritual. I enjoy Dawson's Ezekiel Saw to Wheel as much as the next singer, but come on, it's not even related to the original. With Sacred Harp, you actually hold in your hands and you sing with your voice the original. Not a copy, not passed down, not a tradition. The original. Now, I hope you'll continue to the following videos of Hugh McGraw teaching the class how to sing Sacred Harp and then many favorite selections being led by volunteers, including some for the first time. Again, you will most definitely get more out of this if you follow along and sing from your own book. They are not expensive and they are available at OriginalSacredHarp.com